Thank you, Joe. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here with you today. As you already heard, my name is Stef de Hecht. I'm a professor of anesthesiology at the Ghent University Hospital, and I'm very proud to serve as president of the European Society of Anesthesiology for the upcoming two years. This meeting is for me a great opportunity to share with all of you some of the contributions anesthesiology, my specialty, anesthesiology, and for the different societies of anesthesiologists have made to uh, patient safety, and more specifically, perioperative patient safety. Indeed, anesthesiology is not just about putting a patient to sleep. Anesthesiologists actually are key players in perioperative patient safety. Okay. Just to give you a, number, uh, a few numbers, thanks to our continuing efforts, we were capable of reducing mortality related to anesthesia, to anesthetic events, by 97%. We are about at 3 in 100,000 in the 1950s, and now we are about at 1 in a million. And this is a tremendous advance in patient safety. And why has this occurred? Well, I will quote here the Helsinki Declaration on Patient Safety in Anesthesiology. This is because anesthesiologists safeguard the patient's best interests whenever they are at the most vulnerable period, be it in anesthesia, intensive care, medicine, pain, or critical emergency medicine. And these are the things we are dealing with as anesthesiologists. If I ask you the question, what does an anesthesiologist do? The first thing you will probably think about is putting patients asleep and hopefully getting the patients awake again. This is of course true. This is part of the job. But I hope to convince you that we do much, much more than just putting patients asleep. That's one part. We are also very much involved in the preoperative period. This means the period before anesthesia. We look at the patients, we discuss with the patients, and based on the entire picture, the physical condition of the patient, the circumstances where the patients live, we develop an anesthetic strategy, a perioperative strategy that will make sure that this patient has the safest procedure that one can imagine and deserve, of course. And even more important, we are also responsible for the postoperative phase. The Trajectory is not finished after that the patient has gone, undergone surgery and has waken up. There is a whole period, at least 24 to 48 hours, where we need to take control of the patient. I will show you a few examples later on where you will see that this is a very important part of our uh, profession as anesthesiologist. But let's start with the um, intraoperative phase, the phase of the operation and the anesthesia, anesthesia itself. Let me tell you a brief story of a young guy that came in our day clinic a few months ago. Let's call him Mr. F. Mr. F is a 30-year-old male who suffers from a condition which we call chronic hydranitis superativa, which means that there are separating boils in his skin and they need to be removed. Mr. F has already undergone this operation a few times before, so we can know his condition. And you might uh, be interested to know that Mr. K, uh, Mr. F has become the proud father of a little girl two weeks before, and he has also another child, a two year and a half boy. So here is this young guy, father of two children, happy at home, and he comes in the operating theater for what we call a completely routine uh, operation. Everything goes smoothly, there are no delays, so from an administrative point of view, we are completely clear for a routine operation without any problems, takeoff, landing, without any problems. So the guy, the man, is brought in the operating theater where the attending anesthesiological team is waiting for him. The attending anesthesiology team is myself, a supervising anesthesiologist, a young trainee, third year, so he's already capable of doing things, and the nurse assistant. Of note, the nurse had already been uh, present at two previous operations of um, Mr. F, so she knows a patient and they uh, dis uh, discuss with each other, talk with each other. We do the preoperative checklist, 
nothing wrong to see, everything is okay, and we start the induction. Because it's a routine case, I tell my assistant, my trainee, it's good, you're capable of doing it, I, uh, I leave it up to you, and I will be uh, here uh, looking at you and uh, sitting next to you, and it starts. Give the injection, what we expect, all to be normal, and then almost immediately, after the administration of the anesthetic drugs, Mr. F develops big, big problems. And because if Mr. F develops problems, this means that we as an anesthesiological team are also in trouble. What is happening? He starts to convulse. His blood pressure drops. There is nothing we can imagine what happened. We use completely the same drugs as uh, have been used before. So we rule more or less out an allergic reaction to these drugs. But what is the cause? Is it a cardiac arrest? Possibly. But the problem is that because it's convulsions, we cannot rely on the, on, the, on the monitoring, on the blood pressure, on the ECG, on the pulse oximeter. So we really don't know what is happening. And here you are with a complete anesthetic team dealing with a catastrophe in this young man without knowing what to do, so-called without knowing what is the cause. Well, luckily for us, we have, uh, thanks to the uh, anesthesiological societies, we have guidelines, we have sending operating procedures. Here you see an example of such an algorithm that helps you to uh, react to uh, such situation, even complete unexpected situation. You just follow the situations, uh, you just follow the, the guidelines and you know what to do. And here, that's what we did. What is the first direction in the guidelines? It say, call for help. And that's what we did. Call for help and then we started the resuscitation. Now I will leave you the story uh, of Mr. F for a few minutes and tell you later on what happened with him. What do I want to underscore with this example? Well, no matter how many times you check and you recheck the, uh, the equipment, the condition of the patient, it's not, you can never exclude that at a certain moment, a complete routine scenario turns out into a disaster scenario. Some people like to compare what is happening in anesthesia with what is happening in the aviation industry. That's okay. We know that from the aviation industry, the introduction of a very rigorous checklist have resulted in a dramatic decrease in uh, airplane crashes and airplane accidents. And actually, we do more or less the same. We have our checklist. We control everything, and we can diminish the incidents occurring by uh, wrong medication, by equipment failure, and so on. But what people tend to uh, forget is that a patient it's not a machine. Biological systems are infinitely more complicated and more unpredictable than machines, than planes. So you cannot uh, make the entire uh, parallel with, uh, with the aviation industry. Okay. You know that we are dealing with uh, perioperative um, problems. And anesthesiologists, by definition, are trained, we are really uh, very well trained to deal with these acute catastrophes uh, in, uh, in, uh, during the operation and during uh, surgery. The problem is that this knowledge of a catastrophe that hangs above you uh, is present is an important psychological burden to the um, to the entire team. And therefore it's very important that the team, but also the patient and also the uh, relatives of the patient know that anesthesiologists are trained doctors and that the anesthesiology team is a trained team. So they are capable of dealing with all potential catastrophes. Now, let me go back, sorry. Let me go back to Mr. F. What is the thing you probably remind you of Mr. F? For all the details I have given you. Probably the whole sole thing that you uh, remember is the fact that he's a young father of two children. This gives some kind of recognizability, not also for you, but also for the team that is dealing with Mr. Uh, F. You need to take into account that my nurse and my assistant had the same age. 
So for them, it's a really psychological burden to see that this guy is developing problems. They could be in the same situation. They can easily imagine that they are in the same situation. This is a kind of very uh, important psychological burden. And then again, it's good to know that you have a trained anesthesiologist with uh, years and years of uh, experience uh, under his belts. So at this stage, you might be interested to know what an anesthesiology team is, what an anesthesia team is. Well, at least in Europe, they mostly consist of such teams uh, with a physician anesthesiologist, trained physician anesthesiologist, sometimes a trainee, if you are in the situation of an education hospital, and an assistant, always, almost always an assistant, be it a nurse or a technician. Now, what does this anesthesiological team do? The role is, first of all, to evaluate the patient. Before you start, or before we start the operation, the anesthesia, we know the patient. We know all the uh, medical history of the patients. We know the diseases of the patients, the medication, and so on. Based on this information, a uh, strategic plan is developed and is administered during the operation. And after the operation, of course, there is a con uh, continuous diagnosis, monitoring of the patient to prevent any problems to occur, or if they occur, to treat them as good as possible. So you have this team. This team is, of course, very good to treat the patients, but it also is a unique opportunity to give education and training to the next generation of anesthesiologists. We will not live forever. After us, there need to be anesthesia also. So we train these anesthesiologists. And you need to know that anesthesiology, training to anesthesiology is rather arduous and uh, takes a long time. People really need the training. And the training is given by us, senior anesthesiologists, who have thousands and thousands of anesthesias under, uh, under our belt. But in addition to this training, to this demonstration on how to work, to this education bit to, uh, at bedside, there is also need for continuous medical education. We need to be sure that our colleagues remain up to date, that they know the recent advances, that they know about recent uh, uh, changes and uh, adaptations. And there is a place where anesthesiological societies can play an important role, not can play, play indeed a very important role. Perhaps you are now wondering what a professional scientific society could be. Well, let me give you an example close by, which is our society, the European Society of Anesthesiology. What is our task, generally, is to promote and coordinate the scientific, educational, and professional activities across Europe, and this in order to continually improve, this is the important point, improve the standards of practice, and as a consequence, improve patient safety. There are several pillars by which we can do this. One of the pillars is research. We develop our own clinical studies, we administer research grants, um, we publish the results of our studies in different publications, in different scientific papers, among others, our own uh, journal, the European Journal of Anesthesiology. We disseminate the knowledge to all our members all over the world, uh, via um, the website, via the newsletter, and so on. Another important part of a scientific society is to give an education, to provide a tool to the members to give to uh, continue to have continuing medical education by e-learning, for instance, simulation classes, master classes, and so on. And then very important also, and I uh, already mentioned this, is the production of guidelines. Guidelines help the individual doctors to know how to treat, with, uh, how to treat the different uh, issues that may occur. Let's go back for a minute to the case of Mr. F. What Mr. F developed was a very rare condition. So rare that a lot of anesthesiologists will never encounter this in their daily professional life. 
So they cannot rely on own experience. They need to rely on standing orders that are given in, uh, by, the, by the scientific societies. And it's thanks to these guidelines, the following of these standard operating procedures, that people, persons like Mr. F, for instance, can survive a disaster like what's happening in uh, the case. I will come back to Mr. F later on. What I want to do now is to give you a little uh, story to demonstrate you that our role as an anesthesiologist goes beyond the intraoperative phase. We are also responsible for the preoperative and the postoperative period, like I already said before. The case I want to, uh, uh, to um, give you is uh, the case of Mrs. K. Mrs. K is an 80-year-old lady who needs to undergo a second hip replacement because of arthrosis. She's scheduled for an elective operation. She lives together with her husband, but the husband has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease a few months ago. So actually, she's the one who needs to take care of her husband. The couple is capable of still living at home. They have some domestic help, some social help twice a week, but they can live more or less independently at home. They have a daughter living abroad, so not available, and there are also no other relatives to take care of them or to help them if there is a problem. Like almost all persons of about 80 years, Mrs. K has some additional comorbidities, other diseases that are present. She's hypertensive, she has type 2 diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, and because of all these conditions, she needs to take a lot of medication, what we call polypharmacy. So Mrs. K, even if she's independent uh, living, she is still a rather per, uh, person which is uh, significantly at risk. And because of this, the increased risk and the age of the patient, she's uh, referred to the preoperative anesthesiology clinic. And what does she see, do we see there? Mrs. K has also an additional problem, which is anemia not sufficient red blood cells. This makes this elective operation very dangerous, even more dangerous than it's normal. We don't want to operate an old lady for a hip, fracture, uh, for a hip uh, replacement when she's anemic. So the anesthesiologist takes a very wise decision, says, I will postpone this operation for six weeks and we will try to optimize Mrs. K by giving her some iron, um, to, uh, to increase uh, the red blood cell count. This is done. After six weeks, it appears that uh, um, it appears that the blood tests are completely normal, and Mrs. K gets her operation without any problem. Sorry about that. So Mrs. K uh, gets her operation, and now I want you to imagine two different scenarios. Think about it as a DVD game where you have, depending on the circumstances, a complete different outcome when you have uh, uh, different uh, circumstances. So in the first universum, let's say, Mrs. K is admitted in a high care hospital. This high care hospital has the facilities for continuous monitoring, has the facilities of sufficient staff, so Mrs. K is controlled after the operation, uh, very, is very closely controlled and very closely monitored. Now in the middle of the night, Mrs. K develops bleeding, heavy bleeding at the level of the operation wound. What happens? She starts to bleed, she gets hypotensive, saturation decrease, and the consequence is, because she's monitored, that the monitors go in alarm. Immediately, there is the attending staff. Mrs. K is treated promptly, and there is no problem at all. Everything is okay. She can leave the ward the day after and the hospital a week, a week later, back to her husband to take care of him. Now imagine an alternative parallel universe where Mrs. K is not in the high care hospital, but she's in a low care hospital. This hospital or this situation has no resources or very little resources. No money for monitoring, no money for staff, and there, Mrs. K, after the operation, goes immediately to the ward, develops the same story. In the middle of the night, she starts to bleed, gets hypotensive, 
gets hypoxic, but now nobody uh, sees it. There is no monitoring. It's only the morning after, when the nurse just her around, that she discovered that Mrs. K, K is in big trouble. At that time, she's completely exsanguinated, and she needs resuscitation. She's resuscitated, brought to the intensive care unit, where unfortunately, she develops a pneumonia due to an uh, antibiotics-resistant uh, strain. And she lingers between life and death for weeks and weeks. So, what do I want to prove? Or what do, what do I want to underscore with uh, this example? First of all, preoperatively, there is the importance of the highly tailored uh, care. I've shown you that Mrs. K has a lot of comorbidities and that these comorbidities need to be taken into account. We decided to postpone the operation to optimize her, uh, her blood count, to prevent any transfusion to, uh, to occur. So this is an active action taken by an anesthesiologist. But Mrs. K is not only Mrs. K as a patient. She lives together with her husband, and her husband depends on her. So the longer Mrs. K is absent from home, the more strain this will put on a familial and social situation, and certainly the situation of Mr. K. So we need to take into account that certainly for so, uh, this type of persons, we need to make the hospital stay as short as possible. What is the second message I want to give you? There is an absolute need for appropriate human and financial resources. You have seen in the high care hospital, Mrs. K is promptly treated and there is no complication afterwards. In the low care hospital, if we cannot monitor our patients, if we cannot treat our patients, there is a big problem because these patients will die or at least develop important uh, morbidities. So, you might be curious to know what happened with the uh, two patients I presented to you. Well, Mr. F, Mr. F survived. He was diagnosed. Uh, we resuscitated him successfully. And apparently, the, from the clinical, um, the clinical picture and the blood uh, values, it appeared that he has developed an anaphylactic shock. So he had the fourth time that the medication was used, he had developed at uh, one of the agents that we use an anaphylactic shock. He could leave the hospital the day after and is living happy with his family and with his two children. What happened to Mrs. K? Well, Mrs. K is a little bit a composite character. You have seen that the outcome of Mrs. K critically depends, and of patients like Mrs. K, critically depends on the resources that are present to treat, to monitor, and to follow these patients. So I come back to my initial point. What is the role of anesthesiologists in perioperative safety, in perioperative patient safety? Well, I hope I have convinced you that we play a role preoperatively, intraoperatively, and postoperatively. And it is this integrated approach that makes it possible for us as anesthesiologists to take care of the patients and to give the patients a safe perioperative course. And societies try to uh, continue to even improve this patient safety by working together with other anesthesiological societies, other anesthesiology group, healthcare professionals, institutions, patient associations, and with you, the public. And it's only in this way that we are capable of improving perioperative patient safety for the sake of all our future patients. Thank you very, very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Johannes Wacker. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this, the next panel, a panel about patient safety in perioperative medicine. This has much to do with anesthesiology, of course. And um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm honored and I'm, uh, it's a pleasure for me to moderate this panel together with uh, my colleagues. Um, <clears throat> I should have used the, the prompt, of course. 
First, I would like to start by telling you about two patients and two young physicians. Well, let's travel back in time um, more than a, a hundred years to find the first of our two patients lying on an operating table and in the middle of a, an operating theater, an old-fashioned surgical amphitheater in Massachusetts General Hospital in, in Boston. Um, so this patient is waiting to be anesthetized and to be operated. <clears throat> and from the seats of this surgical amphitheater uh, up there, a young surgical trainee at the time is called down to, to put the patient to sleep. <clears throat> Harvey Cushing is his name. And at the time, he, he is called a junior house pupil. So that's their title. So this young surgical trainee is, is coming down and is starting his work. And as he later reports, and I'm quoting him now, is, I proceeded as best I could under the orderly's directions. So the operation was started. There was a sudden great gush of fluid from the patient's mouth, most of which he inhaled, and he died. So this is 100 years ago. The patient died right there on the operating table from a condition we call massive aspiration under the hands of a young surgical trainee, unexperienced, and during the procedure. So Harvey Cushing and his friend, Amory Cotman, another young surgeon-to-be, were shocked by this and, and by other fatal mishaps they experienced as, as trainees. But they were told that such events were frequent and inevitable. So, in other words, they could not be prevented. But as young physicians or surgeons-to-be, Harvey Cushing and Amory Cotman could not accept this status quo. <clears throat> they decided to improve their anesthetic skills, surgeons improving their anesthetic skills. They started on their own to train their technique to um, observe their patients much more closely and to document their observations. Thereby, they developed one of the first anesthetic records in history called uh, ether charts at the time. So as Harry Cushing later reported, they both became very much more skillful and thereby they pushed the limits of what can be prevented much to the benefit of their patients. Um, Harvey Cushing, as many of you probably know, uh, later became a very famous neurosurgeon, and Amory Cartman became a well-known surgeon as well. But most of all, he be became one of the fathers of quality improvement in healthcare in the United States. And he promoted the idea um, that the improvement of care should be based on patient outcomes which he, at the time, called end results. So, and you know, we have been talking about that yesterday. He published the results of his own surgical practice. He ran a little surgical private clinic in Boston, including his own errors, a couple of hundreds of errors, and five fatalities. And you can imagine that not many of the hospitals he invited to um, do the same, actually followed his invitation. And he later died impoverished. <clears throat> so you can read all of that and much more in Michael Millicent's book, Demanding Medical Excellence, and in a couple of papers I'm, I'm happy to share with you. But you may ask, why consider these things, these things that have happened a long time ago? <clears throat> I'll come back to this in just a moment. <clears throat> but <clears throat> in the meantime, let's travel back in time to, to the present. Remember Mrs. K, 
uh, the second patient that Stefan de Heert has presented in his talk. So since the times of Cartman and Cushing, the intraoperative period and anesthesia have become very safe. Not 100%, of course, I know, but very safe. But complications continue to occur, and they occur in the post-operative period. <coughs> and <coughs> sorry to check my notes. And most of all, or most importantly, 50% of them are thought to be preventable. That is probably why anesthesiologists have expanded their role beyond the operating room to um, intensive care, for example, and to pain management. And this room of improvement that is still there, because 50% of them are preventable, is also a reason that we should reflect on what we can learn from history. First of all, I think just every single preventable patient death is one too many and must be remembered even after a hundred years. And second, um, as the example of these young surgeons shows, humans are not only prone to error, and part of the problem, but they can also become part of the solution by their ability to be compassionate, by their ability to oppose a general acceptance of fatal mishaps as something inevitable, and to work hard to find solutions and share them with others. The European Society of Anesthesiology uh, together with the European Board of Anesthesiology and together with other partner organizations, has created a tool that allows or that helps to become part of the solution. The Helsinki Declaration on Patient Safety in Anesthesiology. This is a very practical framework of safety requirements for anesthesia departments. And by this declaration, by education, by science and research, by clinical guidelines, as Stefan de Heert has already uh, told you, and by developing the professional role of anesthesiologists, our society can support professionals to achieve our goal of eliminating preventable deaths and complications in our patients. And that's what our panel will be about. And may I invite my colleagues and panelists now to join me up here. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for joining me here. I see I need still to introduce myself. <clears throat> uh, I, my name is Johannes Wacker. I'm chairing the Patient Safety and Quality Committee of the European Society of Anesthesiology, and I'm working as a consultant anesthesiologist in Zurich, Switzerland, at Heers London Clinic, a private hospital. And um, I think this is a very special group today here, if we compare it with yesterday's panels. We're all anesthesiologists. We're all engaged in the European Society of Anesthesiology. And I would like to invite you to um, send in your questions if you have any questions um, addressing anesthesiologists. So we're, uh, we're, we're happy to try to answer them. Um, may I ask the panelists to introduce uh, themselves. Maybe we'll, we'll start on the left side with Dr. Zev Goldig from Israel. Good morning. My name is Zev Goldig. I'm the uh, vice president, immediate past president of the European Society of Anesthesiology. And I am the head of the anesthesia, intensive care and pain department in Haifa, Israel. 
And good morning, everybody. I'm Janneke Melin Olsen, an anesthesiologist from Norway, working there. I used to be the secretary of the European Society until the end of last year, and then I moved on to be the president-elect of the World Federation. Uh, but uh, I am lucky to still be allowed to be involved in the Patient Safety and Quality Committee of the ESA. Good uh, morning, I'm Andrew Smith. I'm a consultant anaesthetist in Lancaster, which is a small city in the northwest of England. I'm also privileged to direct a patient safety research unit funded by the UK <coughs> uh, National Institute of Health Research. I'm Dave Whitaker. I was a consultant on cardiac anaesthesia intensive care at Manchester Royal Infirmary. Uh, I've been involved in safety organisations for quite a long time. I'm currently the chair of the EBA Patient Safety Committee and I'm on the ESA Patient Safety and Quality Committee that uh, Johannes chairs. Yeah, thank you for your introductions. And I think um, the Helsinki Sink Declaration is, of course, a core topic for our panel here. Um, Janneke, if we agreed on our ladies first, um, if you're very uh, active in patient safety and uh, like constantly on the move, um, if you think about your own practice, could you tell us an example where you think that patient safety was really an issue and maybe the Helsinki Declaration would have been helpful? Yes, thank you. I would like to highlight uh, one part of the Helsinki Declaration that we have touched upon already here, and that's the role of patients and relatives. I have noticed that people that are uh, involved in patient safety, we are all special people. Most of us are very nice and we are reflective and we are want to make a change. And uh, I have noticed that for many of us there is this defining moment when this interest started. And I will share with you my defining moment. Uh, when I was three and a half years old, I had a brother and he was born with an esophagus that ended blindly. And my mother knew at that time that if there was any chance for him to survive, she had to be with him in the hospital. But at that time there was no childcare or anything, so I said, Mama, you go to be with him in the hospital, I look after my two-year-old sister. And she, she had no choice. So I was babysitting my sister for six months when I was three and a half to four years old. Then he went through several uh, operations and the surgeon said at one point that this tube through the abdominal wall into the, gas, uh, into the stomach was very hard to place. So this must not be taken out. And yeah, that's fine. I was sitting outside the hospital with my sister. My mother was inside with my brother. And uh, he had to go to surgery once again. And then my mother said, please remember, do not take out that tube. Dr. So-and-so said, this has to be in place. And then he was not there, so they just dismissed her. You know, those mothers, they are always pushy. So they uh, took it out, they fought hard to get it back in again, they thought they had succeeded, but it went into the peritoneal cavity. And uh, they fed him and he developed peritonitis and he died. At that time my childhood was over. I stopped playing, I didn't start playing again until I was grown up and now I have more money to play with, so that's uh, in some way a good <laughs> thing. Uh, but. Uh, but um, I wanted to, I stopped playing and I just wanted to change, I wanted to make a difference and somehow that was when I decided to be a doctor and also to be involved in this uh, type of efforts. And my message is, well there, are, there is such things as a difficult mother, but that's a diagnosis of exclusion. Always listen to, to relatives, to mothers and listen to what they have to say and work with them as part of the team. And that's what we are doing as anesthesiologists, working as, as a team, and all stakeholders or all partners in that team are partners. And that's how I'm guided in my clinical life and also in, in my uh, organizational life too. We are all partners. That also includes um, the countries, you know, the European society, we are from, less resourceful countries to very resourceful countries in Europe. 
We share experience, we share this, we do the Helsinki Declaration together to spread, to put everybody getting to a goal of minimal preventable harm. Thank you, Janneke, for this very personal example. And um, I think it, it also um, shows the value of the Helsinki Declaration as a tool, because this, what you mentioned, is part of the, of the Helsinki Declaration. Um, Jeff, uh, you're, besides all your functions, uh, your immediate past president of our society, you've all <coughs> always been very active in education. You know. Could you think of an example of your own clinical experience that shows both the importance of patient safety, maybe the Helsinki Declaration, and education? Yes, I, I want to give two examples. The first one, I was sitting at the pre-operative clinic with my patient and explaining to him what is anesthesia. And uh, he asked, uh, how dangerous is this operation and this anesthesia? How risky? And of course, I used the classical comparison with aviation, and I said, I, we will, I'm the pilot, and I will uh, keep you safe in good condition. So he said, yes, doctor, but there is one big difference. At the flight, the pilot is flying together with me. So we were laughing, of course, and then when I went home, I was thinking, this, he's not completely right, because you know the phenomenon of the second victim. When something goes wrong to us, and we have a, a difficult case, and something goes wrong, so this can change our entire life. And uh, yesterday a gentleman brought the example here in this country, 27 uh, doctors committed suicide <coughs> after uh, difficult cases. The second example is uh, I had a patient for my private practice with allergy to latex, latex rubber. So uh, I committed the, the mistake to take such a difficult case <laughs> to private practice, but this is another story. So I, uh, I try to avoid all the uh, latex uh, components uh, in our operation, and I even decided to, to do a spinal anesthesia only the uh, lower part of the, of the body. The operation was uneventful. It was a hernia operation. And then they took the patient to the recovery room and they called me urgently that the patient uh, had a sudden drop in blood pressure. And they, of course, we anticipated a, a anaphylactic uh, shock because of latex, so we could uh, save him, the patient, and uh, we realized that the cause of this anaphylaxis was they connected the patient to the pulse oximeter, which sensor is plastic outside, but inside it has a thin layer of rubber. So equipment is almost perfect these days. It's improving all the time, but the best equipment is not better than the person using it. So uh, I think this, this is the, uh, the, uh, uh, the message we can take, that the equipment is becoming more and more perfect and is helping us a lot, but we have to concentrate more in the human errors which can be done by education, for example, <coughs> as I understand. For instance, uh, as Steph uh, the Hert said before, 
we, we uh, invest a lot of efforts at the European Society in uh, education. We have a European diploma, we have uh, master classes and uh, scientific uh, activities and research, of course. Thank you very much for this example, Zev. And um, David Whitaker, mm -hmm. David, you have, you're very active in patient uh, safety uh, events and uh, initiatives as well. Mm -hmm. And by the way, by the way um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the three sitting next to each other, Yannick, Andy and David, have been very instrumental uh, in developing uh, the Helsinki Declaration on Patient Safety in Anesthesiology. David, uh, you've been quite active uh, in medication safety mm -hmm. lately. Uh, you've been uh, part or maybe the driving force for the European Board of Anesthesiology recommendations on mm -hmm. uh, safe medication use. Mm -hmm. Uh, could you give us an example uh, that involves medication safety we, we can learn from? Yes, I, I'd like to talk about uh, guidelines. The um, European uh, Journal of Anesthesia, which is society's journal, uh, this time last year published the uh, European Board recommendations for safe medication practice. Um, and, this, uh, and then a bit later on, as we heard yesterday, March, the uh, WHO launched their uh, third global patient safety challenge, so it was uh, very much in line with what's going on. And um, I just, uh, the guidelines were published, just a simple two-page, uh, simple recommendations, and then to help implement them, which is the important thing with guidelines, there's a 13-point checklist that departments can use to help implement them. And I'd like to highlight the first guideline uh, recommendation, uh, which was that all syringes uh, used in routine anesthesia, critical care medicine, emergency medicine, and pain medicine should be clearly labeled. And uh, it's quite a simple recommendation. Perhaps I could just ask the audience, um, the show of hands, if you need an injection on Monday morning, would you want the uh, syringe to be clearly labeled? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. So it's quite simple. Uh, but um, a number of uh, patients have suffered severe harm and died because unlabeled syringes have been used. And uh, to give you an example, um, in 2010, less than a mile from where we are here, a young 10-year-old girl had an uh, arteriovenous malformation on her cheek, and this was going to be a blade. It was a cosmetic operation. And the, in the x-ray room, the doctor had two 10 mil syringes. One had uh, uh, x-ray contrast in, and the other had colorless glue. And he got them mixed up, nobody spoke up, and he injected the glue into the girl's carotid artery. And she was blinded, one eye, severe brain damage, and she's going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. Um, and not only uh, was that catastrophic for her, but it resulted in the highest ever uh, NHS litigation payout of 24 million pounds. So when people tell me that unlabeled syringes are expensive, uh, I tell them that the two 10 mil syringes at Great Ormond Street Hospital cost, 12, cost the NHS 12 million pounds each. And uh, throughout Europe, uh, hospitals still don't provide uh, the ISO colored labels for uh, all syringes to be labeled. And this is something that uh, you know, we'd like to work on uh, with the uh, global safety challenge uh, with the WHO and the patient safety movement. Thank you very much, David, for this uh, example. Not quite from anesthesia, but mm -hmm. that goes far beyond anesthesia. Probably also the, uh, the contents of the guidelines published by the European Board of Anesthesiology. Um, so, uh, Andy, um, you're, besides your clinical uh, work as a consultant anesthetist, you're, you've always been very active in teaching, education, and in research. Uh, so could you give us an example how, um, from your, your own experience or practice, mm -hmm. how um, research could be important for patient safety? Um, yeah, I mean, well, Yannick had talked about um, defining moments, didn't he? And I think um, mine is a moment of revelation, really. and. Um, 
the thing that really comes to mind is a, an occasion um, when I was working as a trainee anaesthetist in a, a large teaching hospital. So this is a few years ago. And one of the theatre lists I was quite frequently rostered to work at was um, for the dental surgeons who are taking wisdom teeth out of, of otherwise healthy uh, young people. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I find that they, these young people were anxious about the surgery out of all proportion to the seriousness of the problem. I mean, it's a big operation for them, I suppose, but it's nothing to do with cancer or heart disease. It's not major life-threatening uh, operation. And um, typically, you'd be on the second or sometimes even the third syringe of anaesthetic to try and get them to sleep properly, when normally one is perfectly adequate. And I remember one particular occasion, there was a, a girl, a, a student at the local university, who was terrified when she came into hospital. This is for day case procedure, so she wasn't going to stay very long. And I tried to uh, explain what was going to happen in the anaesthetic room and what she'd be like afterwards. I tried to reassure her. <coughs> and uh, she came to the anaesthetic room, still very anxious. And we put the cannula in, we put the monitoring on. And having started the injection of anaesthetic, suddenly she sat bolt upright on the trolley and tried to clamber off it. And it was only the quick thinking of my anaesthetic assistant who managed to pull her back down, we got her safely to sleep, that uh, avoided her ending up in a heap on the floor. So when I got to do the list the following week, I thought I'd try and do something different and to make it more pleasant for the patients and certainly safer for the induction of anaesthesia, I, I prescribed them all a sedative pre-medication. And I was working my way along the list in the day case ward, uh, prescribing this on the chart, and I got to the last patient, and I could see sister on the ward uh, collecting the charts up and shaking her head and frowning. And she got to me and she said, you can't give them a pre-med doctor, we never get them out of, out of hospital on time. Thought, well, I tried to explain why I was doing it, but she, she was quite insistent. And so they didn't get the pre-meds that week. But what it did do was drive me to the library that evening, and I worked through the paper copies of Index Medicus. This obviously dates the story before electronic databases. And uh, to cut a long story short, I found quite a number of research articles which showed that you could quite uh, easily give patients sedative pre-medications and, and not delay their discharge. To her credit, when I took sister the evidence, uh, she didn't stand in the way of what I wanted to do anymore. And I think um, what that revealed to me, I think, is that it, when there's scientific evidence behind our practice, whether it's clinical or in patient safety, we should really make the most of it. So it set me firmly on the path of evidence-based medicine. Uh, and that, that review actually turned out to be one of the first reviews for the Cochrane Anesthesia Review Group. But um, it also taught me that knowledge is a powerful ally in clinical and organizational life. Mm -hmm. And it also taught me not to take no for an answer as well. So. <laughs> Thank you very much for showing that research is actually not generally important, but can also be a tool in daily life. Right? Well, I think, I mean, one of the nice things about being able to be involved in the ESA guidelines committee, for instance, was yeah. to make sure that the knowledge we have is, is put into practice. And I think that's a really important function of the society in, in general. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for this first round of, uh, of examples. And um, <clears throat> I think that probably for, for the audience, it, it has become clear that the, the, the Helsinki Declaration on Patient Safety and Anesthesiology is sort of a, a centerpiece for safety activities within the European society, besides all the other foundations uh, that Stefan de Head has already mentioned in his, in his talk, education research. Um, could you think, and I, I'd like to start a more open conversation now, could you think um, on other examples of how the Helsinki Declaration can, can be used to make a, cha make a change at the cutting edge uh, of clinical work, especially of anesthesiologists, but also in the perioperative field? Please, Janike. Yeah, well, I, I think what you can say is that it's a tool for the anesthesiologists out in the field, that they can go to their administrators, to the politicians and so on, and, and to say that this is uh, the standard. You know, this is the European agreed standard, and it's being used that way. <coughs> uh, but I would also like to comment on what uh, Zev sa said about the second victim. 
Because what I have noticed is, of course, we share, as doctors, we share with the patients the same feeling when something has gone wrong. This must never happen again. And that's how we can make the partnership. If we deal with the aftermath of an accident in the right way, working with the patients and so on, it helps us heal and they help the patients and the relatives heal. And for that, we need practical tools. Because when a, 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 an uh, error has happened or a, a mishap or a disaster has happened, we are so shaken that we don't know how to react properly. So to have those tools, and these are also described the, the comprehensive tool for how to deal with patient safety in the Helsinki Declaration. So we are in the same boat. Now we are launching the Helsinki Declaration follow-up project mm. together with the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, in the first example I gave to you, uh, how can the industry know that they have to uh, give us <coughs> sensors without rubber inside. We have to tell them. We have to work together. Mm. We have to plan together how to improve and to uh, avoid preventable, preventable death. This mm -hmm. is the first thing. The second thing is, uh, as I said before, regarding the human errors. Uh, because of stress, because of fatigue, because of uh, we have more and more operations uh, every day, so we have to. We are not robots, and we have to improve and concentrate how to avoid these human errors. Because the equipment uh, is helping a lot, but uh, we we have to uh, be very very careful and concentrate when we work every day, because uh, anesthesiology is not only administering drugs, is to be prepared, like Steph said before, to react. There are anticipated problems and there are unanticipated problems. And these, uh, these problems, for, for this reason, I think anesthesia is one of the longest specialties uh, it takes many, many years to be an anesthesiologist because we have to be uh, a little bit cardiologists, neurologists, internal uh, doctors, internal medicine doctors, and so on and so on. Surgeons. And, and to combine all these, uh, these qualities. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I, mean, I think, that, I mean, the vision, the, vision, the declaration is, is a set of practical tools, but it's also, it's also a, a vision set mm -hmm. out for anesthesiology, um, originally in Europe, mm -hmm. but I think in the yes. same way that the, your, your movement invites people mm -hmm. to, to sign <laughs> up and commit, um, we've never actually done that formally, but it's interesting that about three quarters of anesthesia societies throughout the world have actually signed up yes. to it. So its reach has been much further than Europe. Mm. But more importantly, I think within Europe, it sets out expectations and standards, which allows um, countries that aren't so well resourced something to aim for and something to take to their politicians and policymakers and mm. say, this is how we should be doing it. Mm. So it's about, um, it's about improving standards more generally as well, I think, especially uh, across the diverse continent that we, we're, we're in at the moment. Mm. Another th recommendation of the Helsinki Declaration was to, uh, for all departments to produce an annual uh, safety report. Um, and that would give them uh, at least once a year an opportunity to sit down and review what had happened over the last year. Uh, we asked them to maybe identify three incidents uh, that there was learning from last year and three ambitions for improving safety for next year. And this will uh, produce a process. But another, th another feature of the um, the ESA, which I'd like to mention, is international cooperation. Um, and uh, whenever, in any, any country in Europe, whenever the patient has a cardiac arrest, um, the nurse in the ward rings a telephone number to alert the resuscitation team. And uh, uh, different hospitals use different numbers. And uh, uh, two years ago, we did a survey, and 181 hospitals in Europe use 105 different numbers. And they're not numbers you'd think of, like double two, double two, double four, double four. They were eight one six nine and seven eight four two, things that people couldn't remember. 
The, uh, the Danish uh, group did a survey. Only 60% of the nurses could remember the number in their own hospital to ring, and only 50% of the doctors. Um, so, and 80% of the people in the survey we did said we, they thought it should be the same number throughout Europe. And so, together with the European Resuscitation Council and the EBA, the ESA has recommended that all the hospitals in Europe should use the same number, double two double two. This has already uh, happens in the in the UK, the Republic of Ireland, uh, Denmark, um, uh, parts of Finland, uh, all of Turkey. The health minister in Turkey recommended it, and last year Hermann Grohe, the German health minister, he wrote to all the German hospitals and recommended that they use it as well, and they're starting to use it. So this is something that. Um, other, other countries, Australia, parts of Australia use double two, double two. There's interest in South Africa. And maybe there's something we could work with the patient safety movement to develop a, an app or something in the future. Well, thank you very much for these uh, inputs. In the meantime, um, a number of questions have been sent in. Uh, for example, uh, there's one about CRM. So CRM, Crisis Resource Management, a critical component of great providers has been shown to decrease morbidity and mortality. Can you share how we can make a movement to require all providers have CRM skills to save lives? It likely saved MRF's life. Well, the first uh, uh, patient, uh, Stefan de Head has presented. Anybody want to comment on that? Well, I mean, I mean, crew resource management training. Um, if you're talking about training a whole hospital or a whole health system, uh, that's possible. It's expensive. It's probably worthwhile. But I think sometimes with the patient safety stuff, it's easy to be daunted by the, the size of the task ahead of you. And very often, it's good to start small and mm. use things that are already within your practice and just mm. augment them. So you're strengthening what people do already, really. And what comes to mind with that is, is particularly with regard to the World Health Organization Surgical Checklist, in that it's been uh, mandatory in this country for a number of years now, and people do it, but they don't always mean it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you need to encourage people to do and encourage your colleagues to work within it to achieve is um, to make it work for them. And for instance, uh, this may be a British thing, but the first step is for everyone to introduce themselves. And we're quite modest and we don't like to do that. But I actually think it's quite important because you need to know who everybody is. And it tells you, first of all, it says what we're about to do isn't routine for the patients that are coming. It's very, it's very, it's very special, it's very significant for them. It's not, just a, it's not just a job as it is for us. And it, it's a moment just to remember, just to remember that. Mm. Everyone's name, you know who they are. It has to be proof against locum and agency and temporary staff, because that's uh, all we rely on a lot. And immediately, if you make the most of those briefings and people understand what their roles are and who you might need to turn to if things go wrong, it's not crew resource management as such. We don't call it that. But that's the same purpose. And we need to do what we do at the moment right and better before we start investing in bigger, bigger more expensive things, that's my view. Mm. Thank you. I think, Yannick, you want to come? Yes, I, because I can come with an example from my own country, Norway, which you know is quite large and scarcely populated. And people get injured on the roads all over, and the hospitals, some of them are very small, and they don't see that many trauma patients. But then there is a low-scale simulation, which is actually about team communication in the emergency room started several years ago, it's called BEST, BEST they run systematic trauma uh, training. So that's being done, it's pure communication, just, uh, just training on a simple doll and uh, the communication. And that has spread throughout the whole system. And when it started in my hospital, we saw that the, how we received surgical patients or trauma patients became so much better that the, we started also with internal medicine and so on, and it started with pediatrics and so on, so that you could see the benefit. In, and we can also see how we can use that simple training we do in the trauma room, in the operating theater, in the ICU, whenever there is a crisis situation. The same simple training has been used in Botswana, in Indonesia, and all over, so it's, it's uh, feasible. 
uh, for many situations. But we need to be aware of this uh, team communication skills. I, I would take it a stage further. And I think every morning before an operating list, the first five minutes, the team that are there that day should go through a quick scenario, anaphylaxis, malignant hyperexia, something like cardiac arrest. Uh, David Zeidemann, who organized the medical teams for the London Olympics, uh, they had teams of four people, a doctor, a nurse, physio perhaps, and every morning before, when they met, uh, before they started, they went through a little scenario mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that they were you know, all on message and things. I, I, I used to meet all the patients that are scheduled for heart surgery mm -hmm. in the uh, in coming week. And uh, I have a meeting with them and I explain the, how is it going, anesthesia, the operation, the bypass, etc. And one, one guy asked me, uh, tell me, doctor, heart surgery is a, a very, very dangerous uh, procedure. And uh, why isn't it possible to choose people that will uh, uh, operate me and anesthetize me? So, you know, at the public hospitals, you cannot do it. So I said, I used again the example of aviation. I said, mm -hmm. uh, flying is a very uh, problematic thing. It's, it's, it's very dangerous as well. And uh, you never know who is the pilot. Mm -hmm. But the company, if it's a serious company, uh, will designate uh, a, a person who is capable to do that, responsible for the flight. So is the name, the brand name, and the name, the prestige of the company the same as in, in our hospitals? Thank you, Zef. In the meantime, um, a number of other questions have come in, and I'm, I'm afraid we can't answer all of them. But uh, maybe just a very short answer, if you have one. Uh, there's, there's one um, saying, would you say operation in a small hospital is a risk? And if so, why are they still open? Is there a short answer to that? Um, well, often it's local politics. Um, often the, look, in the United Kingdom, often the hospital is the biggest employer in the town. So the whole series of things like that. But there the have been uh, various studies. So maternity units, for example, um, if you go below 2,000 uh, deliveries, then uh, maybe the team isn't, isn't doing enough. And, and there have been some, uh, Andrew might like to tell us, there have been some um, uh, episodes, incidents in the United Kingdom and big, big reports into the maternity services and, and trying to rationalize those. And this applies. C pediatric cardiac surgery in this country we probably only need three or four hospitals to do it. Um, I think there's about seven at the moment, and there's a plan to, uh, to reduce them. So the surgeons can work in bigger teams, not just single, single mm -hmm. surgeons, and that, again, all the perioperative care and everything is made much better if uh, 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 things are rationalized, really. Thank you. You have a short answer yes, to that? Yes, I think it was very interesting what has been presented a couple of times here in the UK. The safest hospitals were not necessarily the biggest ones. Mm -hmm. So there are some benefits with smaller hospitals, of course, to a limit. So you have to tailor what you're doing to the size of your hospital. But we probably don't have a clear answer why they're still open. This was mm -hmm. the question. Very difficult um, question, of course. So I'm, um, I apologize. We're, we don't have enough time to uh, answer or discuss all of your valuable questions. Uh, may I ask a last round of our panel, ask the panelists to think about a, a take-home message for the audience. If you want to start, uh, Janneke. Yeah, well, first, I feel I have to say, if you think my mother is a, a, you know, a bad mother, she's not a bad mother. She did as good as she could. And I have told her when she has the bad conscience that I'm so happy I'm the person I am. And many others have benefited from our disaster, just so you know that. Then I want to say uh, with, my, with, the, with the, the patients and doctors together. For 20 years, I tried to, to uh, make the politicians install this uh, investigation board as you have decided to do here in the UK. And it was very hard because doctors, we are own, we have second agendas and so on. But then when there were patients and relatives hitting the headlines in the newspapers, 
then the politicians made their move. Another very good example on how we can create a union, a common goal with the patients and, and the relatives and go together to help uh, the politicians make the right decisions. Thank you, Janike. Zef? Well, as I said, anesthesia is not only administering drugs. We are keeping the patient alive and we are working uh, teamwork together with the surgeons, with the nurses, and uh, anesthesia is a peri-operative discipline. So we have to see the patient before the operation, we have to plan carefully our, uh, our work, we have to continue uh, with the patient during the operation, and the post-operative visit is, uh, is very, very important, and not always uh, we are doing it. So I think that uh, 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 our, our uh, specialty is a very integrated discipline, which integrates a lot of uh, 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 aspects of medicine, and uh, uh, this is a, a very uh, responsible uh, discipline. Thank you, Dave. David, any um, message? Martin Bromley, who heard, spoke yesterday, said that standardization is an effective mechanism of reducing human errors in complex situations. And so standardization is my message. Uh, standardization of the labeling of the syringe, maybe even going to pre-filled syringes, so all the drugs are standardized with the ISO colored labels. Uh, and standardize our uh, cardiac arrest telephone number to double two double two. So uh, think global, act local. Thank you, David, very clear. Andy, your message? Uh, I, I guess my, my message comes back to, to knowledge. Uh, and I mentioned research evidence earlier in the science, and that's important, but there are lots of other sources of knowledge we need to draw on to do the job right. And they're the knowledge and experience of patients, for instance. They're also the knowledge and experience of professional expertise that we all uh, use all the time, but we're not always aware of. And the standard operating procedures that Steph mentioned earlier, which allow you to work smoothly in an emergency without having to directly think about it. All these sorts of knowledge are there, and they all interact to, to provide safe, high-quality care. Muir Gray uh, was the chief knowledge officer of the National Health Service and, until a few years ago. And he said once, that knowledge is the enemy of disease. I think that's true, but I think in our context, knowledge is the enemy of risk. And the more we know, the better. Thank you. Also very clear. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, as we're coming to the end of our panel, I hope that we have been able to demonstrate that we as individual anesthesiologists and as a society don't accept fatal mishaps or complications as something inevitable. Medical and technological solutions are important, essential to um, advance patient safety, but they are tools, tools uh, in the hands of professionals that, who create patient outcomes at the clinical front line and, and on a daily basis. And um, the Helsinki Declaration <coughs> is, is, is a tool that our society provides to help professionals to achieve our goal of eliminating preventable, preventable deaths and complications in our patients. Thank you. <laughs>